tonight, the future of the union. The Queen and the First Minister meet in Holyrood as Nicola Sturgeon moves ahead with plans for IndyRef 2. Also making the headlines, frontline workers in the NHS are facing abuse. GPs say they're being blamed for failings across the health service as it struggles with a lack of staff. Missing out on the vaccine, concern that some people are deliberately avoiding getting their COVID jacks. And some piping hot entertainment as the red hot chilies drop in on people living in care homes. I'm Emma Cameron in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. The First Minister's plans for another independence referendum have been called into question by a former Supreme Court judge and a leading academic. Nicola Sturgeon wants to test the legality of her plans in the Supreme Court and if that doesn't work, use the next general election as a de facto referendum. But experts are warning that's a high-risk strategy. At Westminster, familiar positions were set out, the UK government insisting it's not the right time and the SNP claiming they had no right to block it. Our political editor Colin Mackay reports. The First Minister, you might see. The First Minister met the Queen at Holyrood Palace today. There were even presents for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. It's not the 1603 Union of the Crowns Nicola Sturgeon wants to leave, it's the 1707 Union of the Parliaments. The Prime Minister's question. Scotland's First Minister has set the date and started the campaign. The Prime Minister is at the NATO summit in Madrid, leaving his deputy to take questions in the Commons. In the weeks and months ahead, we will make the positive case for independence. Will the opposition, if they can, make the case for continued Westminster rule? Deputy Prime Minister. Thank my, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman. It's always good to see him in his place. Uh, I've just. <laughs> No, no, genuinely, I, it's good to see him in his place. It's not the right time for another referendum, given the challenges that we face uh, as one United Kingdom. The next step in the process is for the Supreme Court to rule if the Scottish Parliament has the power to hold a referendum. One former judge says it's right to test the legality. On the face of it, uh, this is quite a difficult course that the First Minister has adopted. Uh, it's difficult because um, the... Scottish Parliament has no, she needs legislation in order to have a referendum. The Scottish Parliament has no power to legislate on what are called in the Scotland Act reserved matters. Reserved matters include the constitutional relationship of Scotland with the rest of the United Kingdom. There is quite a high chance that the Supreme Court will decide that the bill is not within competence. Uh, but, you know, in terms of um, use of time, it's probably better to get that, uh, that decision out of the way early. If the Scottish Government lose in the Supreme Court, the First Minister's fallback position is making the next general election a de facto referendum. There is no such thing as a de facto referendum. It's an election and we have to be very clear about that. It is an election. What we're doing is that we'll be electing people to represent us in our constituencies and indeed we'll be considering who should govern the country. That's quite different from a referendum. The First Minister says a majority of votes in that election would be a mandate to negotiate independence. But if the UK government won't agree to another referendum, it's hard to see them agreeing to that. And Colin joins us now. So Colin, what are the chances of this happening? Well, it's, it's not going to be easy. First, in terms of the Supreme Court, there's more of a feeling of hope than expectation, I detect, around the, the Scottish government. And if the, the alternative doesn't look that much easier either, getting 50% in a general election is incredibly hard to do. At their peak at 2015 in the general election then, the SNP got 56 out of 59 seats, but they just narrowly missed that 50% of the vote, 49.97. Now, if you add in the Greens, 1.3%, yes, that would have taken it to over 50 
50% for yes supporting parties so maybe come the next general election if that's what this comes down to you might see some kind of yes coalition of parties standing there and that would pose a question for the other side the pro-UK parties because there's no great demand in Labour particularly for getting better together put back together again but do you know what there's a huge legal test before we get anywhere near that political test. OK, Colin at Holyrood, many thanks for that. Doctors are facing daily abuse and having to apologise for system-wide failings. That's according to the outgoing chair of BMA Scotland. Lewis Morrison warned patients are being let down and the healthcare sector is hurtling towards a staff retention crisis. It comes as a new scheme to recruit 800 GPs from home and abroad within five years is launched. Here's our political reporter, Laura Alderman. As the cornerstone of healthcare, GP surgeries are under increasing pressure and face-to-face -face appointments are in high demand. I've been waiting like weeks for an appointment. I did manage to get a doctor's appointment, but I felt I kind of got pushed around from place to place and I really had to kind of push to get one. I'm very happy with the appointments whenever you call in the morning, so mostly, most of the time we're able to get uh, appointment on the same day. It's really, really difficult. Like You can tell the doctors have got a lot of appointments to uh, like run through as well. To try and ease some of the workload, the health secretary visited a surgery in Leith today, launching a new campaign to recruit 800 GPs from home and abroad over the next five years. What we don't want to be doing is just filling up a leaky bucket. So recruitment is absolutely a key part of our strategy, but so is retention to fill that kind of hole in the bucket. The recovery of our NHS isn't going to take us weeks or, or months, it's going to take us years. So we'll continue to invest uh, in health, it's you know, the most significant proportion of our entire Scottish Government budget. We'll continue to invest in the staff and we'll make sure that we remobilise and recover as quickly as we possibly can. Although the focus here today has been on the recruitment of new GPs, staff here say retaining them will be the biggest challenge in the years to come, with the need to strike the right balance between doctors' well-being and their workload. Most of my friends are um, GPs, a lot of my girlfriends are GPs, uh, all my age, and a lot of them are considering retiring or have retired. I am not. Um, stress is definitely an issue. The pressures are huge because lots of problems that hadn't been dealt with during the pandemic are now coming to us. Despite campaigns to attract and train more GPs, the outgoing chair of BMA Scotland says worsening conditions on the front line are making the profession less attractive. You know, I'm very worried about what the medical workforce is going to be like in the next few years. We need to start from a place of honesty that healthcare is going to be difficult to deliver in terms of giving the Scottish public all the healthcare that they need. And I get that expectation, but equally we can't be the ones that are on the receiving end of frank abuse at times because of that. The recovery from COVID will be slow and staggered, as will tackling the more deeply rooted issues present long before the pandemic. Laura Alderman, STV News, Edinburgh. The number of people being vaccinated against COVID-19 in Scotland is high, but amongst some groups of the population, numbers are lower. Public Health Scotland says fewer children, people from ethnic minorities and pregnant women are not getting jags. Researchers say some people are missing out on their vaccination because they're underestimating the ill effects of COVID and doubting the safety of the vaccine. Laura Piper has this report. Another day, another round of vaccinations. At the centre in Gifnock, COVID vaccines are being delivered with extra encouragement for the youngest in line. One of my friends, they got their ears pierced and they were really scared. And I told them, the needle goes through your ear. It's kind of the same except less worse. And then they're like, true, but I'm still scared. And then I'm like, don't be important just to make sure that we're all doing our bit so we can stay open and not sort of revert back to where we were before. But according to a report from Public Health Scotland, noticeably less people of ethnic minority and pregnant women have been vaccinated. Vaccine uptake has been lower in children aged 5 to 11 and significantly lower in people of colour. These music artists in Edinburgh say nothing in the report is surprising. They are part of a leading charity supporting young black and young people of colour in Scotland. The majority of 
women I know are scared to get the vaccine for fear of like it causing infertility because of the lack of it being like tested enough before us taking it. I just think that it's a lack of trust really in the government and just in yeah. health professionals like we don't see enough um, black and people of colour in governing roles and like in higher up positions as doctors or like in the government or whatever so we just don't we don't see ourselves represented there, so we don't feel safe in those spaces. Radio presenter Manulika Singh covered the issue many times throughout the pandemic. She says misinformation has been a key concern. People were not sure about uh, that it will make them infertile or they, they, uh, these vaccines can make them weak. Uh, so these were the rumours going around and that has to be dealt with right away for our community. Early recommendations from today's report include a mix of flexible and targeted approaches to reach and offer support to everyone in the community. I think that the uptake has reduced and I think it's important that people understand that we are here to help. So there is a lot of um, maybe miscommunication and things and we are here to answer questions as well. It's not just about coming down to getting vaccinated. The hope that future vaccination numbers will remain high, but also equal across the population. Laura Piper, STV News. Asylum seekers would be allowed to work six months after moving to Scotland if a new law is passed at Westminster. The MP behind the bill says the move would boost the economy, tackle job shortages and help people integrate into society while lifting them out of poverty. Under current immigration laws, people who fled their home countries can only apply for work once they've spent a year in the asylum system and only for jobs on a restricted shortage occupation list. While they wait to hear if they can stay, they're paid an allowance of £5 a day. Kay Nicholson has more. Sean fled his home in Southeast Asia for political reasons he doesn't want to discuss. He was in the police, his mum was a civil servant. But since arriving in Scotland to seek asylum, they've been unable to work. Sean's trying to find purpose by volunteering and studying. If people are desperate and living with uncertainty, especially in a long period of time, they are more, uh, they are highly likely to be affiliated with organised crimes and also vulnerable to exploitation. If asylum seekers are permitted to work, it will benefit their mental health and well-being. Today, Glasgow MP Carol Monaghan unveiled this. Asylum seekers permission to work it would allow asylum seekers to work six months after lodging their claim. There is support on the government bench. Deputy Prime Minister himself has said that he's open to looking at this. There are some um, Conservatives who are now saying, actually, the figures add up. Why are we paying to keep people in poverty? Supporters say the bill wouldn't just help asylum seekers themselves, it would also boost the economy, generating more money in tax and national insurance contributions and also filling recruitment gaps. It seems ridiculous that you've got a whole cohort of people who are here, who are willing and really, in my experience as a researcher, very, very keen to work, whose talents are being kind of sidelined, who aren't able to contribute. It's not just about being able to make a, you know, a decent living for yourself, it's also about dignity. Over lockdown, many asylum seekers were housed in hotels, including the Park Inn in Glasgow, where six people were stabbed before the attacker was shot dead by police. Campaigners have commissioned their own investigation, but they went to the Royal Court of Justice in London today to push the Home Office for an official inquiry. There has been no accountability for uh, who led and what happened during the during the pandemic for asylum seekers, especially at Park Inn. So it's really important that there is some form of investigation. Activists say keeping up the momentum is vital to support those making a new life here. Kay Nicholson, STV News, Glasgow. Other stories across Scotland and police here are to withdraw all goodwill in a dispute over pay. It means officers won't start shifts early and will finish at their rostered times. The Scottish Police Federation say a derisory £565 pay rise offer has forced them to take action. Police Scotland say it remains committed to finding a settlement. Meanwhile, firefighters are considering taking industrial action. A 2% pay offer has been described as completely inadequate and insulting by the fire brigade's union, with members being urged to reject it. The comedian Janie Godley has announced she's now cancer-free. The 61-year-old underwent a hysterectomy earlier this year after being diagnosed with ovarian cancer in November. She took to social media to pay tribute to the NHS for saving her life. 
as it stands, the scan is clear. So I want to thank everybody who um, supported me, everybody that sent me love, everybody that sent me so much strength and told me, you know, that they were thinking of me. <sighs> yeah, thank you. More than three quarters of Scottish companies say skills shortages are reducing their growth. A report from the Open University also found 70% of businesses are struggling to find the right person for the right role. Firms say COVID-19, Brexit, the war in Ukraine and rising costs have all led to the nationwide shortage. The cancer campaigner, Dame Deborah Jones, has died at the age of 40, having raised millions of pounds for charity and campaigning to raise awareness of the symptoms of bowel cancer. Lorraine Kelly, who worked with Deborah on the No Butts campaign, paid tribute to the brave star this morning. One of the many to speak about the lasting legacy Dame Deborah James's zest for life will leave. Laura Boyd reports. To smash the poo taboo, that's what we want to do. There should be no embarrassment when it comes to talking about our bowel health. Smashing the poo taboo, smashing over £7 million raised for charity and leading a smashing life. Dame Deborah James may be gone, but she will certainly never be forgotten. A regular campaigner and guest on Lorraine, today the emotional presenter led tributes to the star. Well, joining me now is Deborah's great friend Steve Land, as well as our producer Helen Addis. Who worked alongside Deborah on her no buts? Sorry, I know. <laughs> Just seeing that, you know. No, I know. It, it sort of hits you, it does. And 40 year old Deborah's death has hit many hard, none more so than members of the cancer community. We lost our own daughter, Laura, to bowel cancer in 2013, and I met the lovely Deborah, now Dame Deborah. She was just a friend to everyone, and she was just a, a real sunshine, really. My heart goes out to Heather and her dad, and Sebastian and Hugo and Eloise. You know, she's left her family behind, and, and I know how much they'll be hurting today because we've been through it. Victoria Williamson was also a big fan of Dame Deborah's. Only two years ago, I was diagnosed with returning breast cancer. So that was a bit of a blow because I was told that a week before my husband died. He died also of cancer. He did indeed. He was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And how much of an inspiration was Deborah James for you? I, I just thought she was amazing. I, you know, that's going to help so many people. And I think it's going to help people in a lot of ways not to ignore things. So know your own body. When you notice that there's a change and you feel something's not quite right, you've got to, don't hide away, don't, don't stick your head in the sand. Because the one thing about cancer is, if it's found early enough, you've got a chance. A sentiment Dame Deborah James consistently echoed, even in her final statement, which read, Find a life worth enjoying. Take risks, love deeply, have no regrets and always, always have rebellious hope. And finally, check your poo. It could just save your life. Remembering Dame Deborah James. A new space designed to bring Glasgow's Roma community together has been unveiled. Govan Hill has the largest Roma community in Scotland, but many live in small flats without outdoor space. Now, thanks to local activists, six picnic benches have been installed in Queen's Park so large families can enjoy meals together, as Caroline Lewis reports. For members of the Roma community, Queen's Park has long been a place to come together to share food and laughter. <laughs> but it hasn't always been the ideal spot. The problem was that people sat in the grass and the ground is usually wet, which isn't very comfortable. There wasn't a good place to have food and there wasn't anything to put your food on. But that's all changed thanks to the installation of six new picnic benches. <coughs> it's important that we can meet somewhere like this because most people live in tenement flats and they don't have access to a private garden, so meeting here is much better. Govan Hill has the largest Roma community in Scotland and large family gatherings are a part of everyday life. The Roma community is quite family orientated and we like to do everything together, sometimes in bigger numbers. And some outdoor space like this, it's really good to have. People just like to come together and socialise and just spend time together and have a nice time. The park's latest additions were a collaboration between local activists and the city council and one of the benches is specifically designed for wheelchair users to make sure the space is accessible for all. 
We've had good feedback from the community. They've come and told me they can now enjoy time with their family and spend time together in the park, sit down, relax and have some food. I'm proud as a Roma we have done something for other community members, that we were able to work together and come up with an idea and make it all happen. So while the benches may only be a small change to the landscape of Queen's Park, they'll make a big difference to how some socialise this summer. Caroline Lewis, STV News. Rangers youngster Cole McKinnon has signed a new three-year deal with the club. The 19-year-old made his mark at the end of the season, scoring in the win over Hearts. He has now been rewarded by Giovanni Van Bronckhorst. Now, after Scotland's women's team secured a playoff spot at the World Cup, Head coach Pedro Martinez Losa says that the country is proud of him and he's looking to do everything he can to make it there. The Scots qualified after Ukraine beat Hungary in their group last night. The Spaniard said he's made huge sacrifices since taking over and revealed his young daughter Annabella as his inspiration. I have a four years old daughter in London who asked me every single day, Daddy, how are you going to Scotland? She is asking me to see photos about the teams and the games. She's She's very excited also to come to a game and for her daddy to, to play the World Cup with, with the team, with, with the Scotland. So right now, for me, it will mean my whole life because I, I put my 24 hours per day to, to Scotland with the players and with the staff. And finally, with just under one month to go until the Commonwealth Games, para swimmer Stephen Clegg says representing Team Scotland for the first time is one of the proudest moments in his career. Clegg won two silvers and a bronze at the Tokyo Paralympics, but is eyeing to go one better and strike gold at the Games in Birmingham. So excited for Commonwealth Games. You know, I've had I've just come off the back of the World Championships um, the other week, and but I feel like this year the focus has been personally on emotional level towards Commonwealth Games. You know, uh, I've never had the opportunity to represent Team Scotland before, uh, so this is a very rare opportunity and one I'm very much looking forward to. Good luck to Stephen next month. That's all your support from us tonight, folks. You can catch Andy Murray's result on our late news at 10.30. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Now, Sean has the shower forecast. And, Sean, don't tell us low pressure is staying. Well, it looks as if low pressure is going to be around for the next wee while over the next couple of days into the start of July, which means we're going to have to get used to some heavy, thundery downpours at times. And that's been the case today. More of them to come tomorrow and over the next few days. But signs things hopefully settling down a wee bit as we move into July. Let's look at the forecast. Watch out for a sudden temperature drop. Blue Hotels, sponsor STV Weather. Well, some of you may be lucky enough to be heading off to the Mediterranean, so I thought we'd have a look at what's going on there just now. Across Turkey, well, temperatures have recently been below average, back into 30s now, 30s across many of the Greek islands. But look at this oven here across Italy, Tunisia. Temperatures extreme at the moment, 40 to 45 degrees in places. Mind you, if you stepped off a boat, uh, Bilbao, off your cruise ship, and it's 17 degrees in the north of Spain, you'd be very disappointed. And that's because we're in the cooler side of the jet here. And guess who else is in the cool side of the jet? Us, we're right in that little U-shape, that little bucket there. Now, when I say cool, 17, 18, 19 still feels warm when the sun shines out, but the temperatures drop sharply in those showers and relative to elsewhere outside of the jet, much, much warmer. But hopefully, second week of July, things starting to change for us. Temperatures tonight about 11 to 13 degrees. Most of our showers easing away and we'll start to see those showers bubbling up once again into tomorrow morning. So it'll be like this morning. There'll be some quite torrential downpours of rain at times uh, and they will be slow moving as well, light winds. But as I said, when the sunshine does manage to come out, it won't feel too bad. But over the next couple of days, you'll be getting accustomed to your cumulonimbus clouds. That's a big cauliflower white tops. Dark bases give us those heavy thundery showers. Across lights of Arran, Kintyre, the Hebrides, showers fewer and further between. Another showery day to come for many of us on Friday. Bye-bye. Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. And finally, residents at care homes across the central belt have been treated to some piping hot performances. Yes, the red hot chilli pipers have played seven shows in two days in their tour of homes in Edinburgh, East Lothian, West Lothian and Dunblane. Susan Ripple joined them for their final performance in Livingston. 
As Wednesday afternoons go, it doesn't get much more entertaining than this. A private concert by the most famous bagpipe band in the world, all from the comfort of their home. What was your favourite part of that today? Well, it's hard to say. The one stopped another, you know, everything. That, it was an excellent show from beginning to end. Oh, I like all the right modern kind of good swinging it, keeping it going. <laughs> Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, it was great. I thoroughly enjoyed the day. The band is, of course, used to playing lots of shows one after the other, but they say that these past two days have been the most rewarding. To spread the joy, to put a bit of traditional Scottish music with a twist and connect with the people at the care home was just was a great thing to be part of. The care home provider won the concert in a prize at a charity ball last year but it was only supposed to be for one show. I was just a bit cheeky and I asked them if they would do all seven and they said yes immediately. It's great to be able to have somebody of the, you know, the reputation of the Chili Pipers here um, and you can just see the reaction on the residents' faces. They all, they all, they all light up. I mean, everybody does, of course, but uh, it's, it's, it's just brilliant. And today, they certainly did. Susan Ripple, STV News, Livingston. And that's all from us. Thank you for watching this evening. But from all of us here, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye for now. Good night.